Welcome to Bamford Rose and another forum chat. This week I've found a thread on six speed and it's our old friend, the supercharger. Now we did a video talking about supercharging, pressure charging the V8 engine a while back and we've said our piece on it. The V8 engine at a compression ratio of 10.33 to one does not tolerate any amount of boost. This is because if you pressure charge an engine, either turbo or supercharge, you need a significantly lower compression ratio than the naturally aspirated engine uses. So even though the supercharger doesn't achieve the power that it says it does, it can't because it can't wind on that amount of boost to achieve that power, which then means the all up cost is a bit of a waste. Hence the critique previously made. But now with some accusations made on six speed about the car we had in to test, made against us in that we somehow sabotaged or broke the car. Now I need to comment on that thread on six speed where I previously let it lie. I mean, there's some great contributors on six speed, but there are some real clowns too. V12 Stealth being one of the biggest clowns, saying that he's literally tracked his DB9 all day long without suffering any brake fade. Where did you track it? In the paddock? Any driver that grabs a DB9 or the V8 Vantage by the scruff of the neck on its 350 millimeter brakes with its four piston calipers knows that you could get brake fade within a few hundred meters just breaking down to a roundabout on your first application. But hey, if you literally track your DB9 all day long and get no brake fade, then the thrill of that track day must have been the equivalent of a child's merry-go-round ride. Anyway, on to the main attraction, the supercharger. The guy in the States that's marketing the equipment and selling it in that market has come on and accused us of sabotaging the car. So let's just recap the story. There was a car with a supercharger kit on which came here asking for help. It spent all of his money on the kit and hadn't got anywhere near the performance he was expecting. The outfit that installed that kit actually terminated the dyno test because the spark and fueling was looking pretty dangerous and they thought the engine was at risk. So with an engine that he was told was at risk, with power which he can't feel, it's gone missing somewhere, he came here asking for help. He knew that additional power from pressure charge must come from boost. And he got an idea in his head how much brake horse power for a certain amount of boost he would have expected. So he asked us to fit a boost gauge and run a power curve and tell him what the boost was. Obviously, when getting a low boost figure, he could then take that back to the vendor of that kit and say, hey, you know, my kit isn't boosting. I haven't got the power I was expecting. He'd asked us to remap it, but we wouldn't. It wasn't our application. We ran the car on the road through the rev range, data logged ignition, data logged fueling. And concurred with the installer's findings that the spark and fueling was a bit dangerous. Spark was way too advanced and you could audibly hear the engine detonating and fueling was actually leaner than the standard car. So let's just take some of those parameters into consideration. You've got a high compression ratio. You've got an amount of boost, it's not a lot. You've got a more advanced spark than standard, and you've got a leaner fuel value than standard. This is all a recipe for disaster. We wrote a report to that effect, it got taken away, and a while later, quite a long while later, I heard from him again. He hadn't got anywhere with the discussions of where the missing boost or where the missing performance was, but he needed a clutch because his clutch was slipping. Not slipping due to the power, but slipping due to the single plate clutch naturally wearing out as it does. We fitted the upgrade clutch. It got a few questions about the report that we'd previously written, what the boost level was, what the ignition, what the fueling was, and asked for a follow-up. And really the follow-up was instead of saying, hey, uh, the ignition is a bit too advanced, the fueling is a bit too lean, the boost is, isn't quite enough, 
what would we recommend it all should be? So I drew on graphs where the spark should be, where the fueling should be, and for the sort of power that was being declared, what the boost level should be. The car went away from here and actually I've never heard back from that particular gent. Again, according to this thread, we've sabotaged the car. We've disrupted the water injection system. So it wasn't working. So when it left here, there was a problem. And that's why when the car was with us, it wasn't producing the boost. No, this is all complete rubbish. And this particular poster, Red Pants, is making these comments without any first-hand data, any first-hand experience. He can't have first-hand experience of it because he's in a different country. I very much doubt he's actually set his hands on this particular car, worked on it, and he's reporting basically Chinese whispers and made-up stories. But if that's what he wants to write, that's up to him. It's completely untrue. So let's just follow up with some data off a few different engines just to properly put into perspective these supercharger claims on the V8. I'm an engine's performance development engineer and very early on in my career I was lucky enough to work on Rover T-Series Turbo. The Tomcat Turbo is an absolute legend of a car. It's a really good example to use here because that T-Series T16 engine existed in both naturally aspirated and pressure charged turbocharged forms. The naturally aspirated engine had a compression ratio of 10.0 to 1. The turbocharger T16 turbo had a compression ratio of 8.5 to 1. Obviously the naturally aspirated engine didn't boost, it was atmospheric pressure when the throttle blade was open fully. The turbo produced 8 psi of boost. The 220 turbo produced bang on 200 brake horsepower, and the naturally aspirated T-Series produced 136 bhp. So compared to naturally aspirated, that turbo engine had to reduce compression ratio by a whole 1.5 to 1 ratios, and for the 8 PSI boost, made 64 extra bhp. Later on in my career, I delivered Mini Cooper and Cooper S from 2002 into production. Again, this is another engine where in naturally aspirated form, it's optimized in supercharger form. It's been reconfigured internally and again, optimized. So this is exactly the same base engine in both naturally aspirated and pressure, pressure charged guises. Naturally aspirated compression ratio, 10.5 to one. Supercharger compression ratio, 8.3 to one. The supercharger is boosting about 12 PSI. The supercharged Mini produces 160 bhp and the naturally aspirated Cooper produces 114 bhp. That means there is a reduction of 2.2 compression ratio and for the 12 PSI boost that that supercharger delivers, 46 bhp was gained. I'm gonna stretch the next comparison. It's Jag's five liter supercharged engine which red lines at 6,000 RPM. I'm gonna stretch it because I'm gonna compare it with Aston's 4.7 litre V8 Vantage engine, but that red lines at 7.3, 7,500 RPM. So I'm gonna say that that 1,500 RPM cancels out the displacement increase that the Jag engine has over the Aston engine. I'm gonna call these two engines directly comparable V8 engines back to back. The supercharged Jag engine at five litre is at 9.5 to one compression ratio. The Aston engine is at 11.33 to one compression ratio. Now there are a few different versions of the Jag Supercharge, but the one I'm taking in comparison here boosts at 14.5 PSI. The Aston engine that we all know and love produces 420 horsepower, whereas the Jag Supercharged is at 510 bhp. That means there's a 1.83 to one reduction in compression ratio to be able to supercharge that engine. And for the 14.5 PSI boost, that delivers an extra 90 bhp. So if we take those three examples of boost and three examples of power increase for that boost, we can calculate that 11 PSI boost is gonna return 66 bhp. And to achieve that, on average for each of the three engines, the compression ratio needed to be reduced by 1.83 to one compression ratio. If we go onto the Supercharger's website today, 
the 600 kit is billed as taking the 380 bhp to 580 bhp that's a wholesome 200 bhp increase now if we go back to our average increase of bhp for the average psi boost that each of those three engines ran if this supercharger was delivering an extra 200 bhp it would have to have in the order of 33 psi boost for those with any engineering background listening to this 33 psi boost is utterly comical every single hose would be popping off the engine at that boost the colossal heat generated by the pressurized air would take a, a radiator larger than the car to cool down and of course 33 psi boost on a compression ratio of 11.33 to 1 but as always don't let facts get in the way of a good story and if you are thinking of purchasing that kit then for sure please discount my facts here and go and take the advice of those on six speed that don't get any brake fade when they've literally tracked their car all day long or make up stories about us sabotaging cars 200 bhp is one heck of an increase so what i'd like to see is a car that's got this 200 extra bhp third or fourth gear 4000 rpm hoof the accelerator pedal and within milliseconds with traction control turned off obviously the car should be facing southbound on the northbound carriageway but you don't ever see those videos because the cars have been driven by journos in magazines which are paid to advertise certain products or the car is driven by youtubers where most of them couldn't drive a greasy glove up a cow's bottom hope you like that dredging of the forum chat barrel we'll see you on the next one as always really helps us if you can give a like comment, subscribe.